getting back to the point, getting back to this, this idea of the message. And that is that Jesus was trying to make a certain point, which I think that he made pretty good, because when the people heard this in uh, the middle of verse number 16, they said, may this never be. I mean, they understood, hey, Jesus is speaking this against us. As a matter of fact, if you take a look down at verse number 19, that the people, that is the teacher of the law, the priest, chief priest, they look for a way to arrest him immediately because they knew that he had spoken this parable against them. They knew, hey, wait a minute, this isn't something that we just don't have any idea or recollection about what Jesus said. We know that Jesus is speaking about this about us. We know that we are the renters of the vineyard. We know that uh, Jesus is saying, God's going to take this away. He's going to give it to somebody else. And they didn't like that. They were upset by it. They're saying, no, this, this isn't going to happen. May it never be. In their minds, they were the chosen holy nation of Israel, that they had the covenant, they had the promises, they had the law, they had all those things. God was never going to do such a thing. But then all of a sudden, Jesus comes up and he throws in Scripture. Okay? I want you to take a look at verse number 17. In verse number 17, Jesus looked directly at them and asked, Then what is the meaning of that which is written? The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. This is a quotation from Psalm 118, verse 22. And if you go back and take a look at Psalm 118, um, the whole thing, it's, it's really interesting. And by, by the way, the reason why I picked that song that we sang to start out with, that, that really comes from the first couple of verses. Okay, But Psalm 118 is the idea that we need to give thanks for God because He's good. And His love endures forever. And that whole song, or psalm, is the idea that God is there to help the people who come to Him, who have faith in Him, who trust in Him. As a matter of fact, if you read through the psalm, the psalmist is at times very um, uh, in a bad place. He's got his back up against the wall, but he trusts in God, and God delivers him. But then you come on down to verse number 22, and it just simply says, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. In other words, the psalm is saying that the protection, the provision of God isn't just simply open-ended. It's not just simply that God was going to take care of Israel no matter what, that they had to trust in something. To which there's this prophecy there saying you're not going to completely trust in it. Now, what is this stone the builders rejected has become the capstone? Well, if you kind of think back in that day and time, you know, you'd have some people who would be building some sort of a rock structure, a rock house or an archway, and they'd be looking at all the different stones that they've got laying around and trying to take little bits of stones and put them in certain places. And if you think about it, um, if, if you were chiseling, stone with a hammer, don't you think you probably want to find the rocks that fit the best, that would require the least amount of chiseling? I would. I would want to say, oh, well, let me see. Here's this rock right here, and I need something this size. So I'm just going to, you know, chip here and here. Okay. You're, you're going to look for a little rock, right? Okay. So here's this rock over here that the builders, they're looking at, they're like, no, I don't want that rock. I don't want that rock. I want this over here. Oh, that rock? No, I don't want that rock. I want this one over here. No, I don't want that one. And then all of a sudden, they kind of come to the end where they're looking at something that would be the capstone, the stone that would be big and heavy that would lock everything into place. And they say, oh, wait a minute. Here's this stone that we've been rejecting this whole time, and that is going to be the most important one. And Jesus is saying that he is the capstone. He's the cornerstone. He's the one that the Jews have been rejecting and rejecting and rejecting and rejecting, but he is the most important piece of all. Because if you don't have that capstone or the cornerstone, then the whole structure is going to fall apart. Now he goes on to say in verse number 18, he says, Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, but he on whom it falls will be crushed. 
In other words, here you've got this rock. And would you, I, you know, if you think about this big, heavy rock, gigantic rock, would you like to just fall on it? You know, here you are running along, you trip, and you just face plant right on this big boulder. That doesn't really seem a whole lot of fun, right? But it's a whole lot better than if you were running along and all of a sudden the rock would fall off of something and hit you in the head, right? Okay, here's the idea with Jesus. We can either fall on Jesus or we can have Jesus' judgment fall on us. We can either say, you know what? This rock is the most important one. This is the cornerstone. This is something that I can't live without. This is something that is most important to me. And so I am going to fall on it. I am going to put my faith, I'm going to put my eternal destiny, I'm going to put everything right here in what this rock is, Jesus Christ. We can do that, can't we? Now, if we do that, is that going to be painful a time or two? Well, maybe. You know, salvation's easy, isn't it? I mean, God's made salvation easy because, you know, there isn't steps, there isn't requirements, there's not a test. There's not any of those things in order to have salvation. Salvation is by the grace of God, meaning it is the free gift of God. It's free. God's done the work. Jesus has paid the price. So in that regard, it's easy. But what's not easy about salvation is where we have to be in and of ourselves internally to get there. You see, in order for us to have salvation, don't we have to, first of all, understand that we need to be saved? In other words, if we're going to say Jesus is going to forgive me of my sins, then we've first got to understand I have sins that have to be forgiven. If we never understand that I have sins that have to be forgiven, then we're never going to turn to Jesus to say, please forgive me of my sins, right? And that effort that it takes to realize that we are sinners sometimes is painful because it involves humility. It involves us just simply saying, hey, you know what? I can't do it on my own. I can't be good enough. I can't be strong enough. I can't be lucky enough. I can't be anything enough to merit eternal life. Instead, I have to throw myself completely on the grace and the mercy of God and trust that He will do it for me. Now, once we get to the other side, and after we do that, then we can have the peace, and we can have the comfort, and we can have the healing, and we can have the relationship, and we can have the love that passes all measure. We can have all of those blessings. But you know, sometimes to get to that point is a very difficult thing. I remember one time when I was in seminary, there was a um, guy there living in the dorms. He, he thought he was saved, but he wasn't. And the first couple of weeks, the first couple of months, for him to get to that point where he realized that he had sins that had to be forgiven, that was a tough thing for him. I mean, he said, wake at night, wondering, worrying, fretting. He thought about it. He did this. He did that. He did all. He was in constant turmoil to the point that um, it even made him a little bit depressed. But finally, after he came to the point where he was just like, I give up, I'm following on Jesus. He told me he got to that point by reading Revelation chapter 22 about how um, the Spirit, the Bride, all these invitations say, come, take of the water of life freely. When he read that, he said, you know what? That's what I need. Now, after that, everything was good. But leading up to it, it was hard. You see, that's falling on that rock. But that's a whole lot better than the rock falling on us. Because if we don't come to that point of understanding and realizing it, then all of a sudden, one day, we're going to have 
God's judgment on us. Because here is God's salvation to the world. Jesus Christ laid right there in front of us. A free gift. And we don't take it. And we're going to say, God, I can do it on my own. God, I'm, I'm good enough. I'm God, I... You know, that's kind of offense, isn't it? Very much so. So do you see that here we have Jesus coming into Jerusalem, saying, I'm the Messiah. And the crowds, Hosanna, glory be to God in the highest. But then we have the chief priests, we have the teachers questioning, trying to trap him, trying to arrest him, conspiring to kill him, which they do. So here's that formal presentation, formal rejection. But the real question is just simply this for us, and that is, how do we see Jesus? Do we see Jesus as our Savior? Do we see Jesus as our Messiah? Do we see Jesus as our Lord, our Master, our friend? Or do we see Jesus as far as somebody who's distant, somebody who's out there, somebody who's, well, Maybe he is, maybe he's not type of thing. Maybe he's a good teacher, maybe he's a prophet, maybe he's a son, maybe this is right, maybe this is wrong. Do people look at Jesus and say, no, he's not, and flat out reject him? Keep in mind that however we see Jesus really doesn't change in the fact of who he is. That rock is a rock, no matter what. A rock is a rock is a rock, period. But what the rock means and does to us is a different question altogether. So if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, then fall on him. You think, but I, I don't want to do that because I don't want to, want to admit my sins. I don't want to humble myself. But, you know, you have to go through that step in order to get to the other side. And the other side is where you have all the blessings. Before you get there, you don't. And if we have accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior, then let's keep in mind what we have. We have the cornerstone. We have the capstone. It's the rock the builders rejected. But to us, he's something that's key, something that's important. And we've always got to remember to put him first in our lives, in our church. Always put him first in order to give God the glory that he deserves. Let's all bow our heads. Dear Lord in heaven, we thank you so very much for everything that you've done for us. We thank you for your blessings. We thank you for the word, the guidance that it gives us. And Lord, we thank you so much, so much for the sal salvation that you have um, so richly and generously bestowed on us. Lord, we ask that you would uh, help us to understand more about your word and what you've done for us. And Lord, please be at the lost, wherever they may be. We ask that you would convict them of their sins, help them to turn to you before it's too late. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.